Hello, we're back with Baron Victory. Uh, this is the 1730 turn and the start of the Confederate phase. Uh, but at this point, I've decided to call this playthrough a Union Victory because you, you may remember that at the beginning of this kind of informal playthrough, I said that the victory conditions were essentially the control of the Lafayette Road uh, in this portion of the map, and where there's just three turns left in the scenario, uh, the scenario ends at 1900, and at this point there's no, absolutely no chance that the Army of Tennessee could take the Lafayette Road from the Union. Um, uh, even with more turns, I just think the the Union has way too way too much strength on the Lafayette Road for the uh, f for for these units in the Army of the Tennessee to take the Lafayette Road. Um, so I'm gonna so again I'm gonna call an end to this playthrough uh, and to make up for the fact that there was so little activity by the Army of the Tennessee in this playthrough, I'm going to start another playthrough where I'm going to allow the orders we issued to First Corps and to Buckner's Corps and Preston's division here to be implemented on their first opportunity just to see kind of a, you know, uh, an alternative history, as it were, of the playthrough we just finished uh, about what the Army of Tennessee might be able to achieve if it, if uh, if First Corps and Buckner's Corps were able to uh, carry out the orders that they received. So I'm going to close this one. And open a new one. And to speed things up even more, I've actually already done the first, the 1400 turn and the 1430 turn, uh, very much along the lines that we did in the earlier playthrough. Uh, I'll explain what these uh, one markers are doing in a second. So just to summarize what we've done so far, you know, so right now what you're seeing is the start of the 1500 turn and the Confederate phase. Um, in terms of orders, what we did on the 14 and 1430 turn is for the, uh, 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 well, first of all, uh, Stewart's division still has divisional orders to attack the Union Center between the Brotherton and Brock houses. Uh, we issued an order to First Corps uh, to push against the Union forces as far west of the crossroad hexes 16.16 and 16.7 uh, as practicable. So those are, the, the crossroad hexes are these two right here. So First Corps has a, has, is ordered essentially to push any Union forces in this area as far west of these two crossroad hexes as possible. Uh, that, that order was issued in the uh, 1400 turn. And then in the 1430 turn, uh, Bragg issue uh, Bra well during the 1400 turn Bragg moved to Buckner's Corps headquarters and issued an in-person order for Buckner's uh, Corps headquarters and um, and then Buckner's the and Buckner's Corps I could maybe have been a little bit more more specific that I meant Pre Preston's division here but anyways and Preston's division should engage the enemy as needed and control the crossroads at 1613 and, if practicable, at 1411. So uh, this is 1613. I think I missed number, maybe. Uh, I didn't number those right. Uh, what I mean is control, oh, no, no, yes, I did. Control this crossroad here, and then, if practicable, this one, although I think controlling this one might be a tall order. 
Um, so essentially what I want, uh, I want Buckner's core headquarters to move along with, with Preston's division and Preston should secure, uh, definitely secure this crossroads here, uh, protect against any reinforcement from the south along the Lafayette Road, and if possible, uh, control this crossroad as well, and if possible, a support Hood's attack to the north. Uh, so those, so uh, both of those orders uh, arrived during the 1430 turn, and they were put in delay status, but instead of rolling for delay, uh, I'm going to just assume that uh, well, I'm going to assume that during the delay portion of the 1500 turn that both orders we, that we roll and both orders are accepted. <clears throat> and then as far as the, the, the union, the orders that the union has received up till now. Very similar to what we had before. What I've done is uh, I've mo I've ordered 21st Corps and Woods Division to join um, Van Cleve's Second uh, Division of the 21st Corps up here to unify those two divisions under the 21st Corps Headquarter Command, uh, and then I've ordered uh, 20th Corps and McCook and Sheridan's division to join Davis's 1st Division of the 20th Corps down here and aid in the defense. Uh, so not exactly the same as the orders I issued in the previous playthrough, uh, but uh, uh, but essentially the same idea. Uh, and Negley uh, will also, oh, I should have moved Negley. Uh, I didn't do that because Negley enters at 1400, so I'm going to do that right now, do his 1400 and 1430 turns. I knew I was forgetting something, but not a big deal. So, um, and I'm just going to say there, since they're, 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 they enter in column, so first we'll do the 1400 turn, so one, two, three, four, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six movement points. And the artillery gets seven movement points, so the artillery can go here. We'll put Negley here. And then thinking of these as, as, as like B strength level, so they're going to, that will put one, two, three, B, B, B here, and then B, B, B here. So that meets the column road movement stacking requirement. So that's the 1400 turn. And then in the 1500 turn, um, we can move seven more. One, two, three, four, six, seven. I'm going to put Negley to the side for a second. And he'll go one, two, three, four. Actually, he can just move. Uh, just move here. Uh, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, six. So he'll move here. Uh, Negley can just join, satisfy his orders, and join. Uh, the Army of the Cumberland he Headquarters, Negley, and then no. six. Two, three, five, six. So that's uh, Negley's division movement in the 1430 turn. I'm probably ch maybe cheating a little bit here, cause, but I'm going to say that that's good enough. So now we're definitely at the 1500 turn and, and the Confederate phase. Um, and one thing I want to illustrate here is, uh, is things that 
the the attacking force can do to use its artillery in the attack. That's one of the challenges in pretty much any tactical civil war game is how can the the moving offensive side bring to bear its artillery on the defensive side. Um, in this game, the challenge, well, the challenges that you face are, the main challenge is that you cannot unlimber artillery in an enemy zone of control. So I'm not allowed, say, just to like march my artillery up here with three movement points remaining, unlimber it, and then have it be ready to shoot at the uh, at the Union side uh, during the, the fire combat phase. Um, I would be allowed to move the artillery here, but I'm not allowed to unlimber it. Uh, uh, because it's in an enemy zone of control. Um, and th the other challenge is that if I, un if I unlimber within two hexes of, of an artillery unit, uh, that, uh, well, within two hexes of any opposing enemy artillery, that enemy artillery can fire on that artillery prior, I believe prior to the unlimbering. That's really, that's one of the rare cases in, in the Civil War Brigade series that allows opportunity fire. The Civil War Brigade series does not have a lot of opportunity fire, unlike some other sub sy systems. Um, so it can be a real challenge as the moving offensive uh, army to find a way to use your artillery other than standing way off, of course, and doing some kind of long-range bombardment. Uh, so what I'm going to do here is try to find a way uh, for First Corps. First Corps has uh, three counters, each five points of uh, art artillery assigned to it. And essentially what I'm going to do, and, and, and the other challenge is that, um, and well, another challenge is that, I mean, I, what I plan to do is my goal is going to be to set up my artillery on these three hexes right here. Um, one important thing I should point out is this is not a woods hex. This is a clear hex because they're less than 50% of the hex is taken up with the with the woods symbol here. Uh, so so uh, so an artillery unit here would have line of sight into these hexes. Um, it would not be difficult for me to, uh, this artillery starts out unlimbered, so I'll have to limber it for three move, each one for three movement points each, and then move them. But what the Union can do to counter that is in their phase of the 1500 turn, if I do that, uh, and Wilder's uh, brigade is really well uh, positioned to do that. Remember, Wilder's brigade is independent, so it can act sort of at the Union player's direction without having to go through the order process. Uh, Wilder could just bring his his uh, his AAB could could uh, you know create extensions and then distribute his brigade along here and prevent these three are the the, art, the artillery sitting in these hexes from unlimbering uh, because uh, if the as long as the remember these these are uh, kind of like mounted infantry with repeating rifles uh, but as long as they stay in line rather than mounted then you know un, you know uh, unlimbered rather than limbered then they do throw a zone of control into these hexes, and then the, the Confederate artillery would not be allowed to unlimber. Uh, and so what I'll need to do to prevent that from happening is, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up Johnson's division in front in these hexes to prevent the Union from getting into these hex, oh, hopefully prevent the Union from getting into these hexes and spoiling the opportunity for for these three pieces of artillery to move into these three numbered hexes and unlimber um, in the fifth during the 1530 turn. Um, now, once they unlimber, if you know they're if they're continue to be 
uh, Confederate infantry in front, they, of course, the artillery will not have line of fire into, you know, into either Wilder's brigade or uh, Davis's division. But at, once they're unlimbered, the 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 uh, first corps would then have the op could could would then have the option if it if if they decide it's to their advantage to withdraw into these hexes and then at that point all three of these artillery counters would have line of sight um, into these hexes here and to any Union units in those hexes and furthermore they'd be positioned pretty well because on the If you look at the uh, fire point determination table for artillery, uh, uh, a range of two and a range of three is tree is on the same column. Um, it's the it's the second best column, excluding close combat. Um, so, so if the Confederacy well once so once I get unlimbered artillery into these hexes. If the Army of Tennessee then withdraws into those art withdraws its infantry into those art artillery hexes, um, the Confederacy would have a lot of firepower directed at uh, this hex in particular, uh, but also this one. Um, it, it would have at least five uh, strength points of artillery that it could direct uh, with at range two to three into this hex and this hex here. Remember also that this hex is not considered a woods hex because uh, less than 50% of it is covered by the tree icon. So an artillery unit here would have line of sight into this hex here, um, as well as this one, although it would be at range four instead of range three and so on. So that's my plan. And so that's, in a nutshell, is my plan for First Corps. Uh, uh, and I'm going to try to do something similar uh, with Preston's division. Preston's division has two counters of five strength artillery, and I'm going to try to set them up in a similar way, uh, maybe one pointing down the road uh, to help prevent, at least initially, one, one pointing down the Lafayette, south down the Lafayette Road for defensive purposes, and then maybe the other one directed north uh, to help out uh, in the with the, the attack here. Um, so let's, uh, now of course, uh, the, the Union side may have something to say about that plan, uh, but we'll have to see what happens in the, uh, in the Union phases of the, of the turns to come. Uh, but anyways, let's start the Uh, the Confederate phase of the 1500 turn. Uh, the Confederacy, uh, so what Bragg did is Bragg during the 1400 turn moved to Buckner's Corps and then during the, the uh, new uh, issue new orders phase of the 1430 turn Bragg issued an in-person order to Buckner um, and then during the movement phase of the 1430 turn Bragg returned to Army of Tennessee headquarters. And now, if Bragg were to, Bragg, Bragg would need to, needs to stay, according to the rules, Bragg needs to stay at the Army of Tennessee headquarters for one full turn before he can leave and possibly issue another in-person order if that's what he wanted to do. Now, he can, he can issue uh, uh, an, an order via aid uh, right now if he wants to, but um, oh, the other thing I should, uh, sorry, uh, I, I went a little fast there. Um, the other thing I should say uh, uh, about what I've done so far is I've taken some defensive steps here with Van Cleve's division. Uh, as I did in the previous playthrough, I distributed artillery into each of these three hexes, um, which will make, it, make them uh, much more resilient to uh, close combat attacks. Um, and that's all achievable in two turns. I, I explained how to do it uh, in the uh, previous playthrough. Um, and then I extended Beatty's brigade into this hex. I should move, turn the arrow. Just, so the arrow points in the direction of the, of the parent division. 
or parent counter. Um, uh, uh, so this is so this is a, an extended uh, line with B level firepower. Um, um, I moved Wilder's brigade up to occupy the crossroads, as I did before. Um, I did move during the 1400 turn. I moved Greg's division out of the line of fire of the artillery in uh, in uh, Hex, uh, Hex here. Uh, so that's why Greg's uh, brigade is sitting here. And oh, and I I'm slow walking Stewart's division. So Stewart's division is slowly moving uh, its brigades towards. The Lafayette Road between the Brotherton and the Brock houses, uh, but is not rushing to complete a close combat on this uh, on this hex a as I did it before. Um, so, uh, and you are and, and and there's discussion of this in the rules of the Civil War Brigade series. Uh, you are leaders are allowed. You know, a, a leader is expected to make progress towards uh, implementing its order, but if the order doesn't doesn't say something like, you know, uh, you know, uh, attack with you know with uh, attack with as much haste as possible, you know, attack as quickly as possible, or something like that, then the leader is not obligated to attack as quickly as possible. Uh, so so Stuart is is advancing his brigades very slowly with an eye towards kind of just watching what happens here before uh, before Stuart makes a decision about how exactly he's going to implement his orders to to attack the Union Center between this location and you know this this location here all right so I think we're in a position now where we can actually start the Confederate phase of the 1500 turn. Uh, Bragg is not going to issue any new orders at this time. No course, no, no core tax stoppage checks to make. Uh, the Union, or sorry, the, the Army of Tennessee is not going to take any initiative. Uh, delay reduction. So now this is the point where we're going to pretend that you know whatever delay status the er orders to first corps and buckner's corps and Preston's division were that uh you know that we 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 meet those requirements so 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 the orders to first corps and to buckner's corps uh specific you know specifically Preston's division uh, are accepted at this time and then there's no new orders arriving this turn and so we're done with the command phase of the 1500 turn uh, no straggler markers to replace. So now we're at the movement and close combat phase. So so now we'll start to execute the movements I briefly described before. So so the first thing, so w one thing I'd like to note, just going back to the actual order I wrote for a second. Is I've been more disciplined uh, about uh, specifying like the the location where the headquarters order to move should stop moving so i've so in the order that just got implemented in the 1500 turn for first core first core's order to move is first core headquarters to hex 20.18 uh, and that's this hex here the hex that John, the leader Johnson now occupies. So the first thing I'm going to do, and it can do, it has enough movement points to do that. So it's going to immediately move here. Um, and Hood, the leader, will move along with him, leaving behind the, the core supply wagon and the artillery. So, so now, uh, and I should, uh, I'm going to move this to the top. So now First Corps headquarters has reached its assigned destination, so it's bolted down at this point. It cannot move from this hex until it receives a new order, uh, either either from Bragg or through Hood rolling for initiative. 
So now we'll move the artillery, and we don't have enough movement points, as we'll see, to get them into these hexes, but we, we can have enough movement points to get them all one hex short of that. So, so he'll unlimber for three, and then... And then I believe he gets half on the row, takes half a move, half a movement point once he's limbered. The row, uh, secondary road is half, yes. So three, four, four and a half, but it would take three movement points for this limbered artillery to move into this hex, so it has to stop here. And so that's three, four, four and a half, same thing here. And three, four, and then it can go seven here and stop. Uh, the core headquarters will, or, sorry, the supply wagon, I mean, will just move right here. And then uh, f first we'll move F Fulton's brigade. It's in line, so it has six movement points. So it can go one, two, three, four, five, one for the hex, one for the stream, and stop. That's the facing I want it to have. And I, I mentioned this earlier in the video, but again, um, in the Civil War Brigade series, the uh, the Union does not have opportunity fire uh, um, opportunities here. And then, oh wait, I need to move a strength marker, I think. No, I don't. And then, uh, well, move everything at once. It's for two, four, five to there, and then just want to make sure I've got, yeah, so I can go two, four, five to there stop. Uh, and then the Johnson, the divisional leader, has to stack with one of his divisions, so we'll put Johnson here, I guess. And I might point out that one of the reasons I did it this way, or, you know, I, uh, I, I m there might have been other ways of doing it, but one thing I wanted to do is this is the one brigade in Johnson's division that has A-level morale, making it the most resilient to close combat. And I wanted to put that here because it, it, this brigade is just staring down Wilder's gigantic brigade here. Uh, so I think the most, if, if, if the Union ends up doing a close combat uh, during the 1400 turn, it will pr probably land here. I haven't thought through all the the ins and outs of that from the Union perspective, but just thinking about it as the as I would the Confederate leader, um, I, I wanted my uh, brigade with A level morale here. Uh, the other two brigades have B level morale, still pretty good, but not as good as A, obviously. Um, and then Robertson's brigade will go, and then my plan for Law's Law's division will be it's going to attack. Uh, Carlin's brigade here. So it, he has six movement points. Doesn't really matter. Uh, let's see. He could go two, three, f four to there, or he could go two, four, six to here. I'm going to have him go, well, two, four, six to there. I'll leave his 
facing. No, I'm going to change his facing. I think. And then Benning will just follow and end up here. And I think he is a, yes, he's a morale level as well. Okay, good. All right, so, uh, so, th so it's always good after you finish moving a given command just to verify that all your uh, command radius requirements are met. Uh, so, so first core headquarters is here. Division leaders have to be within eight leader movement points of the core headquarters. They are, and then all brigades of a uh, belonging to a given division leader have to be with within four four or less uh, leader movement points uh, from the from the uh, divisional leader, and they are obviously and each division leader is stacked with a brigade in his division. Uh, and, the, oh, and the other thing is, uh, this is core artillery here. Um, so each of these, um, so the requirements for core artillery is it has to meet the same radius requirements as, as a divisional leader does. So it, it can be no more than four leader movement points uh, sorry, eight leader movement points away from the core headquarters. And it, each of them meet that requirement. This is the farthest one, two, four, six, eight. And it can, it can may be able to meet that even more efficiently uh, because it would be allowed to trace on these clear hexes here because uh, these are not in an enemy zone of control. And furthermore, they're occupied by friendly, friendly units as well. Uh, so, so all uh, command radius requirements for First Corps have been met. Uh, now we'll move uh, Preston's division. First, let's move uh, Buckner's Corps headquarters. Let's see, HQ's. I forget how many. I'm going to assume they have the same move, number of movement points as leaders. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We'll stop him here for now. And Buckner, the leader, moved right along with him. And then first we'll move the infantry brigades. So I'll keep them in line. So we'll go one, two, three, four, five, six. And he will change facing. Oh. He's AA, I didn't notice that before. Um, and then he's not on the road, so I think we'll move the road one first. I'm just going to move Preston off for a second. One, two, three, four, five, six. And then Preston will move here as well. I'm going to move the artillery back for a second. Uh, 
doesn't matter, two, three, four, five. Just want to be mindful of this. What do I have in here exactly? Six. There can be th uh, 3a stacked in one hex and up to 10 artillery. So they can stack there. Um, now we'll move the artillery limbers for three, four, five. Five and a half, six. He'll stack underneath, but the artillery doesn't have any more movement points, so can't unlimber. And then, one, whoops, it's three, four, five. Can I put it there? Uh, yes. So, um, and then for as far as B Corps supply wagon, we'll just put that here. Um, and it's pretty clear that uh, all of uh, uh, Preston's division is meeting its command radius requirements along the road here. So don't need to check that anymore. I hope I did that right. Uh, we'll have to make more decisions in the 1530 turn about how exactly we, we want to uh, distribute uh, uh, Preston's division exactly in here. I guess from the union, from the Confederate leader's perspective, I don't. You know what? I'm going to undo my. decision uh, for facing because I really should be thinking about there's always the potential of an you know, of an attack from the south as well as well as from the north so I think overall this is the best facing well he's unlimbered so I mean technically he should be facing the same way but it doesn't matter since he's I mean he's limbered so it doesn't matter All right, so we'll just leave them like that. I might be a little, might be a bit incautious leaving them stuck out there like that, but we'll see. And then I can, now what do I want to do with Stewart's division? So Stewart knows something, knows the attack is on. And so I think Stewart is going to reason to himself that he, how that uh, he should have better opportunities for his attack if he focuses it, you know, to the immediate right of First Corps attack rather than uh, farther north, up the Lafayette Road. Uh, so I think what uh, Stewart is going to do is still be very cautious, um, but just move his. Get his get his brigades across that creek. Um, so that's three movement points. Let's see, does he? He wanted to extend any lines. He has the movement points to do it. Um, I think that would be the smart thing for him to do. So we will do some extensions at this point. You know, as, as always, when you're playing solo, you have to try to think of this you know, from the stand, you have to play the Confederate position from the standpoint that you don't know what orders these units have. They could be, you know, have have orders to 
to attack uh, and just be in delay status and not be moving for that reason. So, uh, so, so I, 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 you know, playing as the Confederate player, the prudent thing to do, I think, would be to, to, to extend lines to increase my firepower along the line there. So. I'm going to do a couple of extensions here. We'll label this one with BASB. And this one with BRSB. We'll grab this strength marker. Whoops, not that one. This one. Move it here. Decrease it to a B. Put it underneath. Um, then in the physical in, a, in the physical game we would rotate this so pointing at the parent division and we'll just say by stipulation that it has the same facing as the parent unit um, and then we'll, we'll need to do the same here And we'll also say that the the extended uh, st extended unit has the same facing as the parent unit here. Uh, always remembering that now these uh, these counters here don't have strength markers, but remember uh, if they don't a is the default if they don't have a strength marker, and that is after after we've extended out. That is these two units are indeed at a. Uh, I should say these two counters are at indeed at uh, a fire level now. All right, so we move Stewart's division. That's all the movement we're eligible to do. Now we need to do. Now we are eligible for some fire combat here. This should be interesting. I think we are. Uh, no ammo, so we're done with movement, no ammo resupply to do. So we're at the fire combat phase now, first non-phasing player combat and then phasing player combat. Uh, I believe uh, infantry fire can be done at a range of two or less, given that there's a line of sight. Small arms, yes. So we're going to have small arms fire between there's line of sight here to here, here to here, here to here, and just kind of across the range here. Um, so generally this line of sight here. This unit is out of range of, these units are out of range of each other, so they can't do fire combat at each other. Um, so first the uh, first the union gets to do its fate. Oh, and then I should point out uh, if it's it probably already evident that up here there is no line of sight due to all these being woods hex hexes. So uh, nobody is fire eligible up here. Um, and I could probably zoom at this point. So how do we? So how does the union want to? distribute its fire. Now Wilder is kind of regretting, I should say Wilder is probably definitely regretting not doing some, not extending out here um, in order to, to increase his firepower because he's very strong at AAB. Uh, 
and Wilder has artillery here, and Davis has five uh, five strength points. Uh, sorry, four strength points of artillery here. He I, I may have neglected to mention earlier in the video that uh, one strength point of artillery was detached up to uh, Carlin's brigade to make it more uh, resilient to close combat and having to retreat due to a close combat or or to, or to fire combat for that matter. Um, I, I, you know the 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 Union's goal right now, as it was in the previous playthrough, is to try to hold the Lafayette Road until reinforcements arrive. So that's what it's going to try to do. Um, so we will... Now the Union has the option of concentrating onto one unit or distributing... I think distributing can make the most sense in that uh, it would force each of these un three units here to make a morale check and potentially have to retreat as a result, um, which would be, be highly in the Union's favor because, I, I mean, best possible outcome for the Union would be if all three of these retreated one or more hexes here, then the Union would be free during its movement phase to move up and, as I was saying before, prevent these artillery units from moving into these hexes here and unlimbering and then making themselves eligible to fire into this clearing. Uh, so I think what we're going to do with the Union is this unit um, I probably didn't, oh, uh, three, yeah, I, di I didn't face this one. Uh, it has to be facing the same way as, it's stuck in this mode where it wants to point towards a vertex instead of a, A hex side. How do you get it? There we go. Finally. No. I guess it's just wrote. I don't know what it's doing. There. Well, that's where I want it. So it has to face. All, remember, all units in a hex have to be facing the same way. Um. So, so this unit is eligible to fire at this one. This one is eligible to fire at this one. At both the infantry and the artillery, and the infantry or a fire level of infantry, and the two strength points of artillery are eligible to fire here. And these are repeating as well. So I'm going to have to briefly ch let's check the rules to see what the for uh, the rules are for repeating rifles. I think they get to fire, tw well, let's see. Well, actually what it is is they, they just roll once, but they use these, uh, these parenthetical values, I remember now, so. All right, so we'll go north to south. So we'll start here. So we have a fire level and one strength of artillery firing here. So that's uh, A at a range of two is two plus one gun point at a range of two is one. So that's a total of three fire point, so we're on this column here. This is, and this defending unit has B morale, I remember. So we'll roll the combat dice here. Oh boy. Uh, so we rolled a six on the three to four, that's a half. The rounding dice says round down, so there are no losses, no permanent losses. However, there's a straggler roll of six on the, we're on this table here, B morale, a roll of six 
is one straggler. So there's one straggler suffered to McNair's brigade. Let's mark that now so we don't forget. Uh, that's Law and Johnson. Uh, McNair is here. And how about that? That's enough to take McNair down to a fire level. So that means this AB marker just comes off. And then we have to check the morale table. 56 is pretty high. Should be careful to check for modifiers. Don't think any are applicable. No. So 56 on the B is shaken and back one. So McNair moves back here and we put a shaken marker on him. So resolve that one. Now this is the big one, or, or or a big one. So we've got a fire level and four points of uh, artillery. So a fire level at range two is two, plus four points of artillery at range two is two. So that's, so it's just, it's just four, okay. Wait, 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 wait. No, that's right, four. So I guess it's the same as before. So we're on the three to four table here. Roll to six as we did before. So that's a half and the rounding die is says round down. So no permanent losses, five straggler on the Five roll for straggler on the B is a one, so just as before this time it's Greg's division gets a straggler. I could be zooming that maybe, but Uh, and then morale is a 46 this time on the B level. 46 is in the no effect reason, region. So, jo so Greg and Johnson hold. And I also need, since Johnson is in this hex, I need to roll on the leader loss table here. So that's a 2d6. Rolled a three, no effect. So Johnson is okay, unscathed. Now we'll do Wilder's fire combat on Fulton. That's a fire level at, um, at range two. Um, just a, just a, Still a two, okay. So two plus two gun, one, three. So we're on the same column as the previous two. We're on this three to four column still. And this is in Fulton, but F Fulton has a morale. Thank, oh, geez, look at these morale rolls. Rolled a seven. So that's one permanent loss. Ignore the rounding dice. Straggler roll of four for A is none. So one permanent loss. 
for Fulton. But a morale roll of 64 on the A. Oh, Johnson should have conveyed a morale assistance to uh, Greg's morale result, but it wasn't needed. It was still no effect. But anyways, 64 on the A is shaken and back one. Um, no artillery here, so he does have to retreat. So retreats here. This did not go well for the Army of Tennessee. So that is all the non-phasing. Here, I'm, I'm going to close this and zoom out just just to make sure here, oops. Um, yep, that's all the non-phasing fire that is eligible. Um, and due to these retreats, there's less phasing fire now eligible than before. Uh, the only eligible phasing, uh, phasing uh, fire combat is Greg firing on this hex here. So we'll do that. Uh, now the range has been extended to three here. So, they're, so these two units are no longer eligible to fire. So A at range 2 is a 2, no artillery. So we're on this 2 column here, it's firing at this hex here. And has B morale rating. So we'll roll. Look at that. Four on the two. Uh, so morale check minus two. Um, straggler four. I don't think. Since there are no losses, we don't do a straggler check. Wait. I think I may have done that wrong for the Union fire. Um, I need to check straggler checks. Just the rules for that. Just one second. 21-2. Make straggler checks whenever a one-half casualty or greater fire combat table result occurs. That's right. Um, so I did do it okay um, for the Union fire because they obtained half uh, permanent loss results that were then reduced due to the, uh, the rounding die. Uh, but this is a, a minus two result, so, uh, so we don't check for stragglers here. So we just go to the morale table, and it's already going to be, even without applying the minus two, I th it's going to actually be a bloodlust, I think. So B fire level up to, yeah, it would have been a bloodlust either, <laughs> either way. So uh, so Heg's division brigade actually ends up bloodlusted. 
to to that fire combat. So uh, <laughs> Union doing very much better in terms of morale results than the Confederacy so far. Um, so that finishes the fire combat phase. Uh, straggler recovery. Uh, shaken markers for the phasing side automatically come off. So these shaken markers just come off. I think I mentioned in a video in the previous playthrough that um, shaken markers occurred during like attack come off immediately whereas if the union had had gotten any shaken markers uh, as a result of confederate fire combat then those shaken markers would per would persist into the union phase because uh, the union does not get to rally during the confederate phase and the same works in the other direction of course as well um, so that's all the rallying that needs to be that can be done. Uh, no stragglers, no stragglers to recover. So that's the end of the phase. So this is a long video. So I'm going to stop here uh, in this new playthrough. And my second video in this new playthrough will be the Union phase of the 1430 turn.